Hi, I'm Jared Gardner, and today I'm going to show you a really cool case. It's a case of a ganglion cyst from the foot with a bonus, a surprise. So uh, make sure you watch till the end if you want to see something really cool. I promise you'll like it. And if you don't, then I don't know what to say because it's the coolest thing I've ever seen. We're almost so. Now look, what we have here is a dense fibrous tissue that's forming these kind of cystic spaces. You can see there's one cystic space. Here's another one right here. Over here on this piece, you can see a nice cystic space. So this is typical of a ganglion cyst. Uh, bursas can also do this as well. So what you get is cystic kind of degeneration that's kind of pushed outward and has a fibrous kind of lining. Uh, the cyst has a fibrous wall, but it doesn't actually have any epithelium lining the cyst. So it's a, it's a pseudo cyst actually. And occasionally you can see a little bit of synovium in them depending on how close you are to the joint. And this stuff out here is a dense regular connective tissue, part of the tendon or fascia from, again, we're in the foot and it's got caught up in here and, um, and it's really wavy. It has kind of these super wavy uh, looking collagen fibers with bland spindle cells in between, which is typical of the, the really wavy stuff is usually not nerve. It's actually usually uh, fibroblastic, dense regular connective tissue like tendon or fascia. And I have another video about that um, and uh, talking about how to tell that apart from nerve and I'll, I'll put a link to that in the comments below. So anyway, this is the, the ganglion cyst. You can even see there are areas like this. This is common in ganglion cysts. A lot of times the, the gooey bluish um, myxoid substance from the middle of the cyst will sometimes ooze out and make this kind of hypocellular myxoid area in the adjacent uh, tissue. So this hypocellular myxoid stuff, even that by itself really strongly makes me think of a, of a ganglion cyst. And you can also see this same phenomenon in digital mucus cysts near the nail folds um, on the fingernails. Uh, which is kind of analogous to ganglion cyst in my mind, kind of a similar process of synovial fluid that's leaking out here. And in some places you can see little wisps of synovial fluid that are still left here in the center of the ganglion cyst. So that's typical. And there's also some areas of fibrin and hemorrhage being laid down around the edge. The adjacent, the adjacent soft tissue has some granulation tissue which is not surprising. So when these things get ruptured, um, they can sometimes have reactive change and you can get reactive vessels and myofibroblasts forming granulation tissue. Okay, so ganglion cyst, and again from low power so you can see it nicely. Really good example of that. So what's the surprise? What's so cool that I'm, uh, you know, is this clickbait or is there actually something cool here? Well, I promise you, it's really cool. All right, look right here. There are these aggregates of kind of pale pink, kind of fluffy looking material that are surrounded by spindle cells and even a few giant cells. I'll go closer to show you. You can see this. So this is very typical of gout um, and the monosodium urate deposition. Sometimes gout is really robust and has huge nodules, but here they're just a few little foci. There's, I think uh, on the other piece there was a little bit as well, but this is the better area. It has a fluffy pale pink look. It reminds me kind of of like pink fluffy clouds or something. I'm not sure if that works for you, but visually that works for me. And it often is surrounded by giant cell reaction. Okay, there's a couple giant cells there. The giant cells can be really purple and dark and so robust as to kind of look scary for malignancy at low power. Here you can even get the vague impression if I flip the condenser, nope, if I flip it down, you can kind of get this vague impression of maybe like tiny needle shaped spaces here that might represent the urate crystals, okay? So as everyone learns in med school, uh, monosodium urate crystals, they show these birefringent polarizing needle-shaped crystals under polarized light exam. So let's take a look with a polarizer here. So I've got polarizing lenses on my scope to show you this. If you don't have a polarizing lens, you can get um, polarizing paper or even polarizing sunglasses, I'm sorry, polarizing plastic film and cut squares out or even polarizing sunglasses and pop the two lenses out. And if you hold one over your light source and the other um, over top of your slide between the slide and the objective, you can use that as a cheap way to have a polarizer. So if you don't have a fancy polarizer for your scope, that's a way to get one. All right, so here we've got the polarizer in and we'll twist it and see. And sometimes it's a little hard to get it to work with a camera, but look, nothing no polarization at all. You can see the collagen in the adjacent um, tendon. Well, look how bright that is. It kind of uh, auto uh, biofringes. It has this kind of greenish uh, tinge to it when you, and this is typical of all dense collagen, but in the, in the middle of the actual aggregates, not a bit of crystals. And so what I was always taught in training is that this is because when the specimen's put in formalin, the formalin dissolves the, the urate crystals and all that's left is this pink stuff and there's no crystals left. Well, I found out 
uh, a couple of years ago during a project about crystals of different sort, that that's actually probably not correct. It's not the formalin as many of us have been taught in pathology. It's actually the H&E stain. Specifically, I believe the eosin, the type of eosin that's used is what dissolves away the crystals. And so what we discovered kind of coincidentally is that if you already have a specimen that's, and it's true, if you take an air dried smear from gout um, and uh, put it over the top of a slide, dry it, um, or alcohol fix it, and then look at it under the scope, it has beautiful uh, polarizable crystals. But if you don't have that, never fear, you can actually still take, oops, you can still take your, um, your tissue block from your formal and fixed tissue and cut an unstained slide. That's right, just an unstained slide with the paraffin still on it. Don't, don't do anything to it, just have an unstained slide cut and take a look at it under the scope. Okay, so here's an unstained section of the same piece. If you've never seen an unstained section, I mean, many of us have them and use them um, all the time, but we don't look at them under the microscope because why would you, right? There's, there's nothing here. The tissue doesn't look very exciting. Um, it's just clear, basically, right? And uh, this little thin slice of tissue doesn't have anything to it until you do an H&E. And all this stuff in the background, this is wax. This is the paraffin wax that's not been de-paraffinized yet. All right? So when we take this section, one thing that we discovered uh, doing this project a couple years ago, and I'll put a link to the paper. It was about sweat gland crystals. We were trying to figure out if, um, if uh, why the crystals were dissolving. And look what happens. We discovered that if you polarize the wax, it gives you this incredible sea of Maltese crosses. Look at that. It's, it's mesmerizing. And you can do this with anything. You can take any piece, any unstained section you have that has paraffin in the background. I think what these are is, I'm not a chemist, I don't know for sure, but I think these are actually crystals of the paraffin wax. But it, as you, ro I'm rotating the, um, the bottom part of the polarizer here, and it's making these Maltese crosses that are basically like swirling and spinning in circles. It's really mesmerizing and incredible. So next time you have an unstained section, put it on your scope um, and without any stain and polarize it. And um, it'll, it'll keep you entertained for a little while because it's really cool. Now, uh, let's look at the area. And again, I was, I was taught that that the gout dissolves because of the formalin, but actually what we found is that even though this tissue here is formalin fixed, let's go find those areas, those pockets we were looking at that looked like gout. Those are those pockets that now are bright in there. You can see the needle shaped crystals. They do look, uh, it is a little hard to capture the polarization on, um, on video because of the lighting and uh, the camera wanting to adjust the lighting. But here you can see a real nice example right in those pockets that were not polarizable on the H&E section, they are polarizable on the unstained. So you can also, uh, one of my residents, Faisal Feta, taught me this. He found a, a, a paper in the literature that described that using, I think if you use um, alcohol-based eosin, use a different variant of eosin, you can do an H&E that will still allow you to see the crystals. But an even easier trick, instead of changing your whole H&E, is just cut an unstained section and look and see if the crystals are there. So it's really cool. Um, I think the gout was pretty recognizable just on the H&E, even without polarizable crystals. But this is such a fun and cool trick. And and it also gives you the chance to see this really awesome background of blazing Maltese cross polarizing um, paraffin, which is just incredibly satisfying to uh, look at. So uh, hopefully this is a cool and new trick to you. Feel free to leave comments down in the, um, the comments below. And um, I hope you have a great day. Thanks for watching this video. Uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet uh, to be notified of new videos and click like uh, down below. Thanks so much for watching.